everybody you can tell it's labor day weekend because it's like church has been like in not empty but smaller and smaller the last few weeks and then it's like okay everybody's back and ready to start fall <laughs> life back in uh well it's good to have everybody good to have uh, a fuller house this morning and just to be able to come to to worship and um you say that there's joy in the house of the lord today and just pray that this morning i was just praying um before the service this morning and just um I don't know, my, what, my, what God has put in my heart was just prayer for, for people that are here this morning and just struggling. Um, maybe there's something in your life you're going through or something that's, that's making you question your faith and just praying for the, the joy of the Lord in your life this morning. And even if you're not in a place of struggling, that would just be true of all of us, that we have that joy of the Lord um, this morning as we walk as his people. So, um, yeah. Uh, I encourage you with that. Um, a couple announcements. So the first one is um, in the back there. You'll see. You might see the big uh, white wire bin. Um, and so it's the time of year again where it's the cap coat drive, um, where we have an opportunity to be able to to give coats to, to those that are in need. Um, and just uh, I, as I was thinking about this this morning, you know, the the, the verse in James came to mind that that. Um, if anyone sees his, his brother in need of clothing and says, oh, just go, go be warm, you know, how can the love of God be in him? And so just encourage you to, to just think, uh, look through your closet, see if you have a coat that, that you could share um, with those in need. Um, there's a special, the special need is, is for kids' coats and, and men's coats. Is that right, Dan? Is just, yeah. So, so if you're a 
if you're a little kid or a large man, especially, but everybody, <laughs> um, I encourage you to, to come bring your coat so you can put those um, in the white bin here, um, and then the distribution will take place, place in October, so the deadline donation is October 6th, so in the next month, if you can look through your closet, see if you have anything um, that, that you'd be able to, to add to that. Um, also, Wacom Dream is doing a financial empowerment class, which is free um, on Thursdays uh, from September 9th. 19th to October 17th, and that's going to be at the Cap Center in Blaine. It's just a, um, they, they, they help you to be able to, to look at your finances and to manage your finances um, in, in some healthy ways and, and, and uh, improve financial management skills and learn techniques that you can start applying today to give you a more secure financial future. And so that's kind of sponsored by uh, Cap as well or, or hosted by Cap as well. Um, and so, yeah, you, that's something you can check out as well. And then the last announcement for today, or one, two more, no youth group tonight because of Labor Day. And then the last one is um, yesterday was Max and Ann's 50th wedding anniversary. Um, and so I was going to say they brought treats this morning, but you'll notice that only Max is here this morning. Um, you know, we, we talk about marriage, and we believe that marriage is, is a way that God reveals uh, his image to the world. And, and truly, Max and Ann, with their, their marriage, is, are people that you can see God's image in. And the reason that Ann's not here this morning is actually because they had a neighbor in need of going to the hospital. And so knocked on their door early this morning, knowing that, that Max and Ann are someone they could turn to. And Ann's at the hospital um, with their neighbor and everything, and just showing that love of Christ uh, to their neighbor. And so um, just appreciate them. Um, so you can congratulate them. Anne might end up being here, um, but if not, you can also reach out and, and, and just congratulate them on that. I asked Max, I was like, all right, so any words of wisdom? <laughs> you don't want me to repeat it now, Max? <laughs> uh, any words of wisdom? And he said, uh, uh, on making it 50 years, and he said, you know, we've never really had like a holler. You know, we've obviously had, you know, squabbles and things like that. We've never had like a hollering match because we, we've always treated each other like we're best, your best friends, and you treat your best friends with dignity and respect and, and kindness and love. And so that's the way we've always treated each other. And so, yeah. So, Max, we, we appreciate you and just the, the image of God that you and Ann are to our church with the way you guys serve and love. And so thank you. And you can pass that on to us, too. Yeah. <laughs> And there's cookies afterwards that, that they brought in. <laughs> All right. No. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they froze them from their wedding day. <laughs> All right. Um, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll move back into to praising and worshiping God. God, we do just thank you that, that you are good to us, God. Um, and just just for your blessing to us, God, that you reveal your image to us in so many different ways through so many different people, um, and, and that we see who you are through your church, um, but then also through your Holy Spirit, God. And so we pray for your Holy Spirit to be at work this morning, God. I do pray for anybody here who's in a place where they're struggling, where they're hurting, where they're struggling with their faith or doubt, that you would be reaching out to them this morning and comforting them and ministering to them, and that there truly would be joy in this house this morning, joy um, in your church this morning, God. So we just pray that and ask you to do it work in us, uh, providing that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Justin. We're going to invite you to stand with us once again. Here is here. You are our one desire. 
nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you Great, your love is greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is! Nothing compares to this. i uh-huh.
God, we praise you for all who you are, God, for your love, for your justice, for your mercy. You're our provider, our healer, God. God, you're so, so good to us, God. God, we pray that you would help us to love you more, that you would shape us to become more like you, and just that you would be at work in our lives by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. like to worship by giving, you can do so online at bcfgiving.churchcenter.com or there's an offering box in the back. Um, we have several visitors today. If you're visiting with us, we're not asking you to give. We're not after your money. We, we just feel that we want to honor God with all that we are and, and, and want to be able to worship him in that way. But we're just glad to have you with us this morning. Um, let's go ahead and dismiss our kids for kids church. So preschool through second grade in the elementary room and third through fifth grade in the youth room.
And so if, you're, if this is your first time with us here this morning, um, we, we have a value here that we believe all of, of God's word is inspired. We believe it's all authoritative for us and for our lives. And so rather than just picking and choosing the topics that we want to talk about, um, we like to, to pick books of the Bible and go through them and, and see um, what God teaches us as we go through them. So um, we uh, earlier this summer started out with the book of John, and so we're just a couple chapters into John now. Um, and so where we're at, if you remember, so the very first part of John was like an introduction, kind of who Jesus is, who we are going to see him to be as we go throughout the book. Um, and then, uh, John the Baptist talking about who Jesus was and then his, his, Jesus' disciples encountering him. Um, and then the last couple weeks we talked about Jesus changing water into wine and, 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 and what it revealed about who he was. Um, and then last week we looked at Jesus as, as he went into the temple as he flipped over the tables there, and we talked about um, um, what Jesus was proclaiming about himself, what he was proclaiming about the, the, the religious practices there, um, and, and who he was revealing himself to be uh, and, and that. And so we're going to continue that today with, with going through and, and seeing what happens after, after Jesus cleanses the temple um, and this next encounter that, that uh, we're going to start this week, but we'll actually finish up next week. So... Um, uh, so picking up in John chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 23, and it says, Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name, and when they, when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. One of the things I love about preaching is it forces me to slow down, you know, like when I read through the Bible sometimes, like I'll read a chapter at a time, and if I read chapter two of the book of John, I'd focus a lot on like Jesus changing water to wine and cleansing the temple, and then I get to this part, and I would like, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus knew it was in the heart of men, and kind of maybe think of that and then just go on, but as I preach through stuff, it makes me slow down and really contemplate it and everything, and this is an interesting passage when you really look at it here, because it says that many people believed in Jesus, believed in his name, but he didn't entrust himself to him. And there's actually a play on words going on here because it says they trusted him, but he didn't entrust himself uh, to them, right? And, and so what's strange about this, which catches up off guard, is because it says that these people believed in Jesus. And that's what we want to do is we believe in Jesus, want to believe in Jesus. In fact, John says in his gospel, the reason he wrote the gospel of John was so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and believing you might have life, right? So, so John says, I want you to believe in Jesus. That's why I'm writing this gospel. That's why I'm writing and telling you these things about Jesus, is I want you to believe in Jesus. Um, and, and, and he started off his gospel. One of the first things he says is that all who believed in, in Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. And so then it seems strange here, so early on in the book, that he says, these people believed in Jesus, but he didn't believe in them. He didn't entrust himself to them, right? That these people had faith, but in some way that their faith was insufficient. It was not the right type of faith. It was not the right kind of faith. And it's a little bit off-putting, right? A little bit disconcerting because what's the immediate question we ask when, when we read like there's people that had insufficient faith or didn't have the right type of faith? What's the question that comes to your mind? Is my faith sufficient? <laughs> right? I don't want to be in that group of people that, that Jesus doesn't entrust himself to. And so how do I know if my faith is sufficient or not? How do I know if I have the right kind of faith? And luckily, Jesus is going to give us the answers to those, those questions and what comes right after this. And so um, in John 3, it says, Now there is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And so John is going to bring in this, this, this Pharisee, this conversation that he's out of this Pharisee, Nicodemus, um, and he's going to introduce us to him. And through this, he's going to actually answer that question of what does sufficient faith look like? Because I think that Nicodemus here is a picture of those whose faith is insufficient, who believe in Jesus in a sense, but don't have that sufficient type of faith. And why do I say that? So you have to remember um, you know, we have all the chapter divisions in our Bible. We have all the headings that help us find stuff when we go through the Bible. But when John wrote the Gospel of John, there was none of that in there. He didn't write chapter 3 or anything like that. He was just writing along. And so if you read this all together, it starts off and it says, there were many in Jerusalem that believed. And why do those people believe in Jesus? 
They saw signs, right? What does Nicodemus comment on uh, about Jesus? Why does he he's, uh, uh, believe that Jesus is a good teacher? He says, because no one could do the signs that you do, right? And then right away, actually, in, in 2 23, it says that Jesus knew what was in a heart of, a, of a, it, what was in man. And then the next sentence is, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. And so what, what John is trying to do is to show us that, that Nicodemus is a picture of this insufficient faith. And so this conversation that Jesus has between Nicodemus, uh, that with Nicodemus is going to help us to understand what does sufficient faith look like? What does real saving faith look like? How do I know if I have a faith that saves or just that, just that acknowledges uh, who, who, Je- who Jesus is? Um, so uh, the first thing that we see in this is, is it says that Jesus knew what part of man? The heart, the in, you know, he was in man. Jesus knew the heart of man. And so the first thing that we see about our sufficient faith is that sufficient faith takes place in your heart. Sufficient faith takes place in your heart, right? It's not just an intellectual, you know, assertion like, well, well I believe that Jesus came from God, uh, that Jesus was the son of God, that Jesus was God, that Jesus died and rose again, that I intellectually assert those things, but that has really no bearing on my life, right? It's just something that takes place in my mind, like, yeah, I think that's true, right? That that's not a sufficient faith. Like, he, like, uh, like Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we believe you are from God because of all the signs you're doing. No one could do those signs, right? Intellectually, Nicodemus asserts who Jesus is, but there's no heart transformation. There's no, no heart change that takes place. Growing up in the Bible Belt, um, you know, this is, this is one of the things, it's funny when I go back to, to Missouri and like I tell people I live in Washington, sometimes they're like their faces, like you, you might as well tell them that you live in the Soviet Union or something like that. Like they're like, oh, so sorry. It's so dark there. <laughs> I was like, we talk about it's so amazing here. Uh, but uh, like uh, one of the things I actually appreciate about here is there's not as much cultural, um, you know, cultural, um, not collateral, not the road, but anyway, there's not cultural pressure to, to go to church, right? Like, back in Missouri, everybody has their church. Like, and they, you say, oh, what church do you go to? Now, they may go Christ, Christmas and Easter. They might go every Sunday, but, but it doesn't really mean anything to them. But everybody has their church, right? And so it's hard to know, like, who, who just kind of, like, says, well, yeah, I grew up. Yeah, I believe Jesus is God's son. I believe he died rose again. Why wouldn't I believe that? Um, and who's whose faith is active in their life, whose heart has been transformed by the gospel, right? And I think that, 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 that John is wanting us to examine ourselves and say, do you just, do you just say that, that Jesus is God? Do you just say that he died for you? Do you just say these things? Do you just believe those in your head? Or is there something that takes place? Is there a reality in your heart, right? The other, the other way that we, we have to look at that, that this is it's... Um, it's not just in our head, but it's also, we can't just look at our actions, right? When we look at, at, at this conversation that Jesus has, who's it with? Nicodemus. And what was Nicodemus? A Pharisee, a Pharisee. Now, oftentimes, like, we, you know, we read the Bible, and there's lots of confrontation with Jesus and the Pharisees, and we can maybe picture him as a little bit, like, you know, weaselly or evil or something like that. But, you know, Nicodemus, what the Pharisees believed is that they wanted to usher in God's kingdom, and the way that they were going to bring in God's kingdom was by keeping all of God's commands, keeping all God's laws, and getting all of Israel to do that as well. And so Nicodemus wanted to do that. We're not really given, this, this conversation isn't really confrontational. Like, we're not given any reason to doubt the genuineness of Nicodemus. Nicodemus would have seemed like a good person. Like, if any of us met Nicodemus, if Nicodemus lived in Blaine, we would say, that's a good guy right? He keeps God's law. He, he follows God. That's a righteous guy. He was an upstanding person. Like, and so, so when we talk about sufficient faith, it's not a matter of our head, but it's also not just a matter of our actions. Nicodemus did all the right things. Nicodemus kept God's law. Nicodemus was faithful to, to God's commands as much as was, he was able to be, right? And so, so it's not about Um, assenting the right things intellectually. It's not about doing the right things. Sufficient faith is a matter of something that takes place in our heart. And Jesus is going to explain this a little bit more fully uh, to Nicodemus. Uh, 
I guess that before I go on to that, um, that, that, you know, you can believe all these right things about Jesus. You can, you can believe your, your theology could be impeccable, right? Do you believe Jesus is God's son? Yes. Do you believe that, that, that he died for you? Do you believe, you know, like your theology could be better than my theology, but it's not good theology that saves us. It's not good works that save us. It's a heart that is attuned to the Spirit of God. And that's what, what Jesus is going to pack here in this conversation. And so he goes on, and Jesus answers him. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, um, this is a well-known statement, right? Like, this is sometimes ways, like, I, I've had conversations with people, they're like, oh, they find out you're a Christian, like, you're a Christian, but, but are you born again, right? Like, meaning, like, are you really committed to God, like, God? It's interesting, though, that we, um, that, that, that we use this language or, or anything. Um, it's, what's interesting to me is the way that this gets translated. So, in Greek, this word that comes after born is kind of hard to translate because it means two different things. It can mean again, or it can mean from above, like someone born from above. And so as a translator, you have to make a choice, like because we don't have a word in English that means both of those things, obviously. But it's interesting that all the translators always use again. And the reason they, I think they do that is because Nicodemus understands it to be again, because he's going to ask a question like, well, how can you be born again? What does that even mean? Um, but what I think that it's supposed to be is that Jesus is actually saying that, you're, that, that you can't, um, unless a man is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus misunderstands uh, what Jesus uh, means. And so I think that, that that's a, a better translation. Um, the other reason I think it's better is because it kind of implies both, right? If you're born from above, you would have to be born again as well. And so you kind of get both in there. So when you're reading this, you can even like write a little note in your Bible. If there's not a footnote, there should be a footnote in your Bible. But if there's not, write a little note of above there because the, the word has, has both meanings. And I think that that's what Jesus is trying to say, say to Nicodemus. Unless someone is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God, right? Unless someone is born of, uh, above, you, you don't have a, a faith that is sufficient, a faith that is a saving type faith. And, and so what does he mean from born from above? So when you think of a, a new little baby, when we think of, of a baby or new life, like that's what we think of is, is, is something that's completely new, right? One of the excitements about a little baby is that their whole life is ahead of them. Their whole future is ahead of them. It's kind of, it's kind of unknown, like, like there's, there's something new that's going on. Um, and, and so I think what Jesus is trying to teach Nicodemus is you've got to be born again, you've got to be born from above, is that you need to be reborn. You need a new life, a new being, a new spirit. You need transformation. That sufficient faith involves transformation. Sufficient faith involves transformation, right? He doesn't say, Nicodemus, well, you're pretty good. You know, there's a few things you need to work on. You just need to make a few tweaks in your life, you know, get rid of some of the negativity in your life and, and move on forward, and then, and then you're good. He doesn't just say that to Nicodemus. He doesn't say to Nicodemus, like, well, um, you know, like, like I, I don't like this about your life, but I like this thing over here. So just, you know, get rid, of, get rid of this bad thing over here and then move forward to this good stuff. Like, he doesn't say that. He says, your Nicodemus, your life needs to be new. Your heart needs to be transformed. If you want to examine yourself to say, is my faith sufficient? Am I one of those people that, that Jesus would entrust himself to, that, that I have that close relationship, that I have a sufficient faith? As we look at our hearts and say, has my heart been transformed by him? Have I experienced new birth, new life in him? Have I been born again, born from above? Have, have, have I experienced those things? As Paul says, uh, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Do you have new life in Christ? And what, is, what does that even mean? So to take the example here. What is this that you see up here on the screen? Tadpoles, right? And if you think about tadpoles, um, tadpoles, uh, uh, how do tadpoles get around? Perfect time in the video. How do tadpoles get around? The tail. They swim around with their tail. They live in the water. 
Like, how do, how do tadpoles breathe? Anybody know? They have gills, right? And then one day, their legs pop out, they crawl up on land, they absorb their tails, not all in one day, but, but, but they, they, uh, they, they go up on land, and their, their whole life has existed in water. Do you know what tadpoles eat? Tadpoles are herbivores. They eat like algae and plankton and, 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 and things like that, little, little microscopic plants. And then one day, they sprout legs, their tails go in, they go up on land, and instead of breathing with gills, they breathe with lungs. The, the air they breathe is different, or what they breathe is different. What they eat, you know, they, they, they go from being herbivores to being carnivores. They go from swimming around. Yes, frogs can swim, but not really in the same way that tadpoles swim. Right, their existence is completely new. Like what motivates them, what, what they, they look for in life, other than so instead of swimming around looking for sweet little plankton, they hop around looking for yummy bugs. Right? Like what, what they're drawn to changes. What what where where they live changes. Everything about their life changes. I think it's a it's a beautiful picture of what new life is supposed to look like a complete transformation, right? Jesus is not just saying to us, well, you can just change a little aspect of your life. You know, maybe you're struggling with, with this addiction or this thing, but you get over that, and then, then, then you're good. You know, like a lot of people come to Jesus when, with those kind of struggles in their lives, and they just like feel like, well, if I just make this change or this little tweak in my life, then I'll be good. And what Jesus says is, no, what you need in your life is complete transformation. You need a heart that has been born in me, born from above. That is not just full of yourself, full of things world, that, that looks at the world around you differently, that interacts with the world around you differently, that acts differently, that values different things, that sees the world differently, that, that you need to be a completely new person. That is the type of faith that is sufficient to God. That is the type of faith that, 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 uh, that, that he entrusts himself too, that, that, that John wants to create in us as we look at the picture of who Jesus is. Jesus goes a little deeper with this metaphor. He says, Jesus said to him, how can a man, or Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So like I said, I think Jesus is saying you need to be born from above, um, and then Nicodemus misunderstands this. This is kind of a common pattern we'll see as we go through the book of John. We've actually already seen it a little bit. Jesus says something or does something. Somebody misunderstands it, um, and then Jesus corrects it. And so I think that's what's going on here is Jesus saying, no, 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 not again, Nicodemus. You need to be born from above. And what does it mean to be born from above is it means that you're born of water and spirit. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what did Jesus mean when he said born of water. Um, some people say, well, that means like, you know, when you're born as, as, a, as, a, as a human in the flesh, your, your mom's water breaks, and so you're born of water there, and then spirit's kind of the second birth. But I don't think so. Like, the, there's, that wasn't really a common way people talked about being born back then as water breaking and, so, and stuff like that. And what Jesus seems to be saying here is that water and spirit, being born of water or spirit, is the same as being born from above, is the same as being born from again. Um, so other people, they say, well, what he's talking about here is baptism, that you need to be baptized in, in water, like as a Christian, we, get, we just had baptism a few weeks ago. You get baptized in water. You get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. And I don't think that's quite. I think that's closer. I think what those things point to is what Jesus is talking about here. But I think there's something more. And actually, there's a, there's a prophecy in the Old Testament by Ezekiel um, where, where he says something. And I think Jesus is drawing upon this language here. In Ezekiel, God's people are living in exile. They've, they've sinned. They've been cast out. Sorry, this is a little bit smaller. I also apologize about this screen. I have some technical difficulties. We'll try to get that back up for next week. But um, yeah, hopefully you can read it. If not, I'll read it to you. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. And I'll give you a new heart, and I'll put a new spirit in you. And I'll take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I'll put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. So Ezekiel makes a promise, or God makes a promise through Ezekiel to his people, and he says that, that he's going to work with them in water, in a washing of water, and then in his spirit. And, and what is the water washing away? Their sin, their filth, right? They're, they're washing away. Specifically, Ezekiel mentions the idols, 
right? The things that you hold up in your life that you worship, the things that you give your attention to, right? The, 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 the things that, that, that your life is dedicated to, right? All of us, we have these idols in our lives. We have these things that captivate our hearts that we give our attention to. It can be uh, the, the, the quest for uh, money. It can be the quest for sex. It can be the quest for, for, for influence. It can be just the quest for feeling loved by, by someone, right? Like we, we have these idols that we put in us, and, and they lead us to, to, to do things uh, that are abhorrent to God, to things that dis, dismiss God, that make us gods of our own life. And he says, I'll wash those things away from you. And Jesus, I think, is referencing this when he says to Nicodemus, you must be born of the water. You need to, have, you need to be cleansed from your sin. You need to be cleansed from, from those idols that you worship. You need to be cleansed from those things in your life that take your attention away from God so that you can be wholly focused on him, wholly focused on who he is. Right? And then the other thing he says is that, that, that I'll give you a new spirit. Right? Um, and here in Ezekiel it says that, I'll put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Um, and, and I think the, the idea here is that, that there's other places, Ezekiel and Jeremiah talks about God writing the law on our hearts, right? That God's people were called to follow him, were called to follow his, his commands, and, and, you know, we're told that we, we, we can't do that, but, but, but ultimately, by his spirit, he changes our hearts so that our heart becomes more in line with God, that we become more like him, that as his spirit works in us, the, the things that God loves, I learn to love those things. And so it's not like a burden to try to keep his commands, but, but it's a joy because I want to be like God because I've, I've learned to see the value in what he commands. I've learned to see the value in what he does, that he is changing my heart. And so, so what we see when we kind of put this all together is that the sufficient faith that Jesus is looking for is, is faith that involves cleansing and regeneration that this transformation that takes place, this born from above that takes place, that, 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 that this new life involves washing away the idols of our, own life, our old life, washing away the things that captivate us and draw our attention and so we can focus our worship and our attention on God. It involves, an, uh, uh, go, involves God putting and writing his law on our hearts so that our hearts are in line with his, so that we love and desire what he, he loves and desires, so that we hate the things that he hates, so that we become more like him as his heart, or as a, a, his spirit is at work in our hearts. That is the kind of transformation that is taking place. Now, I want to say really quick here, when I talk about all this transformation and, and, and talk about, um, you know, like God, God changing our lives, replacing our, our idols, those kinds of things, you might say, well, what about if I grew up in a Christian family, gave my, my life to Jesus at a young age? Um, you know, like I don't have a dramatic testimony. I wasn't like selling drugs one day, you know, when I was three and then decided to turn my life over to Jesus and everything, right? And so I don't have this dramatic testimony. Does that mean my faith is not sufficient? And I don't think that's what this means at all, um, but I think that, that you should be able to see how your life has been transformed by Jesus. That it's not just that, you, um, that you're like, well, I'm a Christian because my parents were Christians, but that you can actually see in your life, like, I can see the inclinations of my heart. I can see the desires of my heart. I can see where those things that get me, and I've submitted my heart to Jesus, and he has changed me. I see where my life would be without him, and I know where my life is because of him. And so I know that, that I am with him, that my life has been transformed, even though it's transformed at a young age. Right? I heard one person say, you know, God saved me from from addiction and drugs and promiscuity and, um, and, and rage and anger and murder. He saved me from all of those things when I was four years old, right? Like the idea that, that without him, I know where I would be, that I experienced a transformation in my life even when I was young. And so I don't think that this pre precludes like, well, if you gave your heart to Jesus at a young age, that it means that your faith is insufficient. That's a beautiful testimony. That's a wonderful testimony. But I do think it, it should encourage you to examine your life. Like, has my heart really been changed? Can I really see how my life is different because of the work of the Holy Spirit? Have I really been born from above or, or reborn in him? We 
We see something else in this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. So Nicodemus has this word that he keeps repeating over and over. It's this word can. He says, no one can do these signs that you uh, uh, do unless God is with him. And how can a man be born again? I don't get it. How can, how can a man be born again? And then after all this, this, Jesus says, how can these things be? Right? Nicodemus is very concerned with how can these things you're saying, how can they be real? How can they be true? I don't get this. From my perception, from the way I see things, these things don't make sense to me. And I think that the, the picture here is that this insufficient faith is that, that, that this insufficient faith is not able to understand the things of God. It doesn't, that, that, that Nicodemus sees the world only through what he's observed, through what he's realized, and, and, and he's not able to see the world more fully. And, and, and the sufficient faith changes the way that we see the world. Sufficient faith changes the way that we see the world. If you're not aware, football season is upon us. How many people here would consider yourself Seahawks fans? Okay. How many people here would consider yourself Chiefs fans? <laughs> nice, I like that. How many people here would consider fans of another NFL team? All right. Well, we're some, what, what, what team do you consider yourself a fan of, Chad? Chargers. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, Manny, how about you? The Cardinals, obviously. Why obviously? From Arizona, right? He's from Arizona. He roots for the Cardinals. Leads a miserable life. <laughs> why, Chad, why do you root for the Chargers? And they're from L.A. Because <laughs> I'm from San Diego, and the Chargers used to be in San Diego. Um, I, my, my kids, you know, it's, it's a little different. They weren't born in Kansas City, but they, they grew up in a, in, a, in a household of a Kansas City household. So we're Chiefs fans. You guys are, are, are uh, Seahawks fans, a lot of you, because you, you were born here, right? Where you're born affects who you root for, affects how you see things. Um, how many of you, um, if, you're, if your sibling committed a crime... Um, that you would, you would turn them into the police. Like, if they, if they committed a crime, like a bank robbery or something like that, you would, you would turn them into the police. How many people would say, I would, they came to me and asked them to help me cover it up, how many people would help them cover it up? <laughs> Great, the pastor's kids raised their hand, wonderful. <laughs> right, so, so a lot of this, so there's a little bit of difference here, but, but largely... In American culture, like we value law, we value order, we 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 value we have like a, a, a legal type culture, and so we'd say, well, it doesn't matter who you are, even if you're family, if you break the law, you need to to pay the penalty. That's our value that we have as Americans. But there's lots of cultures in the world where um, family and commitment to family is an ultimate value, and so that commitment to family trumps anything else. And so um, to to you should show that love and that commitment to your family, at least not turning them in, if if not helping them. Uh, to, to cover it up, even if you don't condone their actions, right? We have those different values because of the different places that we were born, the different places we were raised, right? Our worldview is different based on where we were born. The same, and so the same is true when you've been born from above, right? If you've just been born from this earth, if you've just experienced the, the birth of, 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 of human birth, you view the world one way, but if you've been born from above, born from heaven, your origin is different, and so the way that you view the world is different. What you think the cans and what you think is possible is different. You know, Nicodemus says, how can this be? How can you work like this? God, I don't, I don't get this. But what, uh, and, and, and there's many things that, that the world looks at us as Christians and says, how, how can you believe that? That seems foolish to believe. But by God's Spirit, we believe that God works, Right? I, you know, I, I can wrestle with this, especially growing up in our culture where we have this kind of naturalistic, you know, what we can observe, what we can see, like that's what's, uh, what we can know, right? And, and we've been raised in that mindset and it can fluster us, right? I can struggle with, I don't understand why prayer works. I don't understand how prayer works, but I believe by God's spirit that prayer works, right? I believe uh, by God's spirit that, 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 
like, I, I, I not just believe it, but I've experienced, like, his comfort uh, in times of trouble and things, times that I should be stressed and concerned and worried. I've experienced God's peace. Peace. I believe that he can give me peace in those times when I don't know what's going to happen, when, when the situation seems dire, that, that I can trust that God's got a plan, that God's working out. I, I see the world differently because I've been born from above. As people that have been born from above, we should believe that God is at work in the world. We should see God at work in our lives. We should expect him to be, to be active, that, that, that we know that, that, that he is a God who is at work, that he is a God who saves, that he is a God who is powerful and mighty, and we expect him to act in wonderful and mighty ways, not just at our whims or our control, but, but as the sovereign God who is in control, that we believe those things about him. And it changes the way we see the world. It changes the, the way the things that we value in the world, that we don't just go along with our culture that pressures us into certain values or certain ideals, that we look to his word to, to learn what does God value, that, that, that we look to, to him first to see those values, that, that even when we don't understand those things, we say, I recognize that my understanding is limited, and so I trust you, even the things that don't make sense to me. God, I trust you in those things, that, 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 that we build our lives on those, that, that we see the world differently because we have been born from above. We are God's children. And Jesus has one more thing to say about what that means uh, of being born from above, being God's children. He says, that which born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel uh, when I say you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Right? So um, it says that, that, that spirit begets spirit, you know, flesh begets spe- flesh, like that as the spirit is at work in our lives, that that's how we're born from above, born by the spirit. Um, and then he builds this analogy with wind, and we kind of lose it a little bit in, in, in English here. So I've kind of told you this before, but whenever you see wind or spirit or breath in the Bible, in both Greek and Hebrew, those are like all the same word. And so when he says here, the wind blows where it wishes, it's, it's the word pneuma, where we get our word pneumatic, you know, like stuff involving air. And so it says the pneuma, pneumas, where it wishes, the wind blows where it wishes, the spirit spirits where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from, where it goes, so it is with heaven who is born of the pneuma, of the wind, of the spirit, right? And so the idea is like, we go outside, and we, we know that the wind is real. We see the effects of the wind. There's no doubt in anyone's mind, none of us have ever said, well, I don't believe in the wind, I can't see the wind, right? There's no doubt in our minds that the wind is real, we see its effects, we see where it goes, but we also can't control the wind. I mean, we could put like a fan and make like little fake wind, but you know, we can't stop tornadoes, we can't stop the wind from blowing, like we have no control over the wind. The wind, even though it's something we can't even, is not tangible, that we can't really even see, it kind of has a mind of its own in a sense. And, and, and so uh, Jesus is saying that's what God's holy wind, God's Holy Spirit is like as well, that, that, that you can see the effects of it. You don't have control over it. You don't have the, the ability to, 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 to lead it or, or to will it anywhere, that, that the Holy Spirit of God, he has a will of his own, um, and that it, that it blows wherever it will. The Spirit spirits wherever it will, right? How can someone be born of the Spirit? Well, the Spirit has to work upon that person for them to be born by the Spirit. And so ultimately, what I think Jesus is, is teaching Nicodemus here is that sufficient faith is initiated by God. Sufficient faith is initiated by God. Now, this gets into all sorts of questions like predestination and, and things like that. Well, does that mean that God just is going to save, save uh, like, like certain people? And, and gets into all sorts of the deep theological questions uh, that I'm not going to try to get into in the next five minutes. Um, but uh, what I will say is that I, that I think that God is at work, that God wants to draw people to him. I believe there are people here this morning that, that may not have that sufficient faith, a transformed heart in their life, and God wants to draw you to him this morning. God wants to work in your heart this morning. That the spirit is spiriting, the wind, is, the spirit, wind of the spirit is blowing on your heart this morning, and he wants to, to translate, tran, uh, to, to not translate, transfer, to, 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 
to transform, that's the word I'm looking for, sorry, transform your heart here this morning, that he wants to be at work in your heart this morning. And that none of us, when we ask this question of, so, so, so that's one application. So the other application is that none of us can say that we created a sufficient faith in us. When we talk about the sufficient faith, you know, this is where it can go into like, you know, like a workspace thing. And we don't believe in works. We believe we're saved by faith, right? It's not about our initiative. It's about the work of the Spirit, that the Spirit is blown on all our hearts. Through God's sovereignty, he has blown on our hearts, and we, uh, and, and we can allow that spirit to work in us. We can allow that spirit to transform us. That it's not about the things that we do, but it's about the things that he has done in us. That, that the Holy Spirit is at work in us, that God has initiated salvation, that, that he has taken and transformed our hearts to create a sufficient faith in us. That it's not just about seeing, you know, that the, the, the people saw signs and wonders and, and they were seeking that. It's not just about like seeking that or seeing that and, and thinking, oh, yeah, that, that God is real, but it's about letting his spirit fill your heart, transform your life, change the way you think, change the things you value, change the way you see the world, that, 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 that he is creating you into God's children. The Holy Spirit desires to be at work in you, making you into his child. That he wants to give you new birth from above. And that for those of us that have experienced that new birth from above, that, 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 that we can rejoice that it's not about anything that we have done, but that the work of the Spirit has been in our lives. That Jesus gave of himself so that we might become children of God. That his body was broken for us so that we might be born from above. That his blood was poured out for us so that we might experience new life in him. Uh, Dan and Nancy, would you guys be able to help with communion? So we're going to take communion here this morning. We're going to remember the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, if this is your first time with us here, um, we believe that this communion is open to anybody who believes in the death and resurrection of Jesus, and not just as an intellectual thing, oh yeah, I believe that that happened, but, that, but has a heart that's been shaped and changed by that, that you've experienced that, that birth from above, and so we invite anybody that believes that and has experienced that rebirth to come and take communion with us. If you don't believe that, we're not trying to make anybody feel judged or left out or anything like that, but this is something that's meaningful to us, and so um, uh, we ask you to just let this pass you by. Um, you can take a little piece of bread and a cup, and you can take it back to your seat and hold it. We'll take it together. Um, there's also some prepackaged cups that have like a wafer and juice in there if you prefer that. So come up and receive this and take it back to your seat and hold it, and we'll take it together in just a minute.
um, whatever your story is, where you say, yeah, I, I mentally said, yeah, Jesus is God. Jesus is, is, has died. Jesus rose again. But I've never experienced that transformation in my life. I encourage you, uh, just after the service, grab me, talk to me. I'd love to talk to you more about that and, 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 and pray with you and, and discuss that with you a little bit more. Um, and just encourage you to, to follow through with what the Holy Spirit is working in your heart right now. Um, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God, we thank you for the new life that we have through Jesus Christ. That the old is gone and the new has come, that we have experienced birth from above because of the death of Jesus. May he was willing to cleanse us from our sin, cleanse us from the idolatry in our lives, cleanse us from hearts that were focused on anything but you, and took that sin on the cross. And we take this bread and we say thank you for that love of Jesus that allowed us to be born as your children. And God, as we take this cup, Remember the blood of Jesus, but also that it's, it's a cup of juice. The, the, the life that that represents of, 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 a, of a vine just growing and filling, filling and um, just reminded of the new life that we have because of the blood of Jesus. That it's not just about getting rid of something from our lives, but it's about giving us something more, about giving your spirit to us to change our hearts, change our minds, change our lives, and to make them more like you. We take this cup, we say thank you for the blood of Jesus that allowed us to experience that new life in you. How great is the love that the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. God, we thank you that as we know you, that we have been born from above, that our lives are changed from here. And so, God, we pray that you would help us to lead those changed lives, to live out those changed lives, um, to, to live as your people, that your spirit would be at work in us, making us more like you, God. God, I pray for, for whatever you're working in people's hearts here this morning, that they would respond to that as you will, um, and just that you would be at work in us, and that, that our faith would be sufficient, not because of our own hard work in it, but because of your spirit at work transforming our lives and our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace be with you all. I see Anne's here. Welcome, Anne. Congratulations.